The state of Alaska is arguably the least connected of any of the United States. Aside from Anchorage and Fairbanks, many cities and villages are accessible only by sea or air for much of the year. The small fishing village of Bethel, Alaska is one of those landlocked towns. Located on the western side of the state, Bethel is a lifeline for the dozens of tiny villages that dot the Kuskokwim River. The river and surrounding wilderness provide a way of life for many families here, most of whom are Yupik Eskimos. Sourcing food here in the winter is a challenge to say the least. I'm meeting a local Yupik, Anna David, who's going to show me the ropes. So I'm going with Anna to her good friend Lucy Crow's house for a little lunch. I'm Andrew. Andrew. I'd, like, I'd like you to meet Lucy Crow. Hi. Nice to meet you. Thanks for having us in your home. Lucy is preparing a variety of traditional native dishes. When she and Anna were growing up, there was no electricity, no refrigeration, baking was unheard of. Everything they ate was either fresh, dried, or smoked. Today, we're eating something called stinkheads, Ooh. boiled blackfish, seal soup, once again, a gutuk or Eskimo ice cream. Look at you just tear into the stinky stuff. That unrecognizable stinky stuff can be summed up in one word, stinkheads. These are actually fish heads that have been buried and left to rot, then dug up and eaten weeks later. And this is safe to eat, right? Mm -hmm. All right. Oh. <laughs> Those smell ripe. Are you it's into these like, also? It's just like uh, eating aged cheese. That's, that is very true. You even like it? Um, it is, it's, you've got to get past that, uh, that taste on the back of the mouth and just, there's nothing wrong with the flavor of those mm -hmm. or the texture, but just that where I come from mm -hmm. in the lower 48, mm -hmm. we're taught that fish that's gone bad, you shouldn't eat it. So I just have to keep telling myself I'm not eating spoiled fish. There are two things you should follow when you're eating in this country, your nose and the noise. The Taiwanese are very loud and boisterous eaters. I'm in the village of Shenkeng, just outside of Taipei. And trust me when I say it's a good thing this isn't smell -o vision there's a stench in the air of overly fermented cheese or even rotted garbage. The source, stinky tofu. It's the national dish of Taiwan and trust me, it's everywhere. There's fried stinky tofu, stinky tofu boiled in soup, your basic plain stinky tofu and the eat as you go version. Hot griddled stinky tofu skewered, rubbed with spices, split open and stuffed with fermented cabbage is a delicacy here. And it's sold at one, two, three different street stalls all on the same corner. You know my rule of thumb, always go where the line is longest. I can't believe I'm waiting in line for something that truly, well, stinks. The smell here is like hot sizzling Limburger cheese. It's pretty potent. Stinky tofu is often served with chili flakes or paste. And as usual, I have a habit of ordering two of something that I'm not even sure I'm going to like. All right, stinky tofu. Here goes. Like a lot of the world's most inconceivably strange foods, it looks, sounds, and smells a lot worse than it tastes. This is delicious. There's a slightly fermented and spoiled quality to it that reminds me of really great cheese. Mm. Oh. But the bonus here is that tofu is a lot better for you. It's delicious. Now, remember those words. I may have to eat them later. First, a little tofu history. Shenkang is the source, and it all starts here at the Wang Tofu Factory. This place provides 90% of the tofu for the region, including Taipei. That's BS, before stink. Every day, owner Chun Jung Wang and his small group of employees grind the soybeans, boil them, and create the paste that they then press into forms for tofu up to 20,000 pieces daily. 
It's been done this way for centuries, and the Wangs take pride in their hands-on operation. Tofu demystified, I'm feeling even more confident about heading back to Taipei and taking on what's been called the ultimate. Here it is, something every traveler should experience, Dai's house of unique stink. And you guessed it, everything on the menu is made from stinky tofu. But this isn't just any stinky Hello. tofu. This stuff nice is made by the legendary Ms. Wu. Oh, nice to see you. Can they make the tofu upstairs? Yeah. Yeah? We make it tofu. It's two stories up, and I can already smell something foul. Ms. Wu's laboratory, as it seems, is filled with vats of varying stages of stink. She starts with blocks of frozen tofu that are immersed in a secret black mixture of fermented vegetable matter. As the tofu thaws, it absorbs the bacteria. That's ripe. Oh, she's slathering it on there. Yeah? Oh, it gives a, oh. It's a whole new meaning to the term smell my fingers. That was This tofu cute. is so unique, each piece is stamped with Dai's logo. The pieces are transferred to a new vat of room temperature matter every few days. These things are alive. This is that. living food. You do that. I'm waiting for something to leap out of there and grab me by the throat. It takes about two weeks for the tofu to reach its ultimate stink factor. And at that point, it's packed up and put in the freezer to keep until Ms. Wu is ready to prepare it. As I anticipate eating the ultimate, I think about all that earlier bravado way back in Shenkeng. You just can't believe how good this is until you actually get your mouth around it. Mm. Whoa! The smell of this stuff alone beats the street version ten times over. It's been a long time since food has intimidated me as much as I am intimidated sitting in front of these two dishes here. I can only imagine what the cooked Taiwanese hamburger, that's cow stomach with the fried stinky tofu bun, or the stinky tofu with thousand-year-old egg salad is going to taste like. I'm scared to try either one, quite frankly, and, well, I guess there's no delaying. Oh. Mm. I can't do it. Wow. Woo. Here's the problem. The cooked stinky tofu tastes so rotten, I can't get it down past the back of my mouth. It's that automatic reflex that just tells you, don't do it, you can't eat it, you can't eat it. There's a sour, spoiled flavor in my mouth that is absolutely singular. There's nothing quite like it. It's like rotten nuts uh, mixed with rotted fish. Now, the cooked stinky tofu that I had on the streets in Shenkeng, well, that doesn't even compare to this no way, no how. I mean, that's like comparing boxed or jug wine with a 75-year-old Burgundy. I mean, this is, it's not even in the same ballpark. It's not even the same food. That is absolutely horrifying. Okay, I've gone from scared to repulsed, but I said I'd try it. Raw stinky tofu salad mixed with thousand-year-old eggs. <sighs> Then in this corner, oh my gosh, bring this back. <laughs> no way, you take that. Ah. Um, this is the fully dressed and liberated 14-day-old stink, garnished with nuts and little fried crispies and scallions and the thousand-year-old eggs. Oh. Let's see how this is. Oh. Ah. I could squeeze that down. Oh, man. You know, I was under the false impression that gilding the lily with all of the scallions and little tasty bits would help. This is just... <sighs> the 14-day-old tofu at the House of Unique Stink is just too putrid and foul for me. Miss Wu, 
Hello. Thank you so much, Sheshe. That was awesome. Thank you. Give me Thank a hug. Thank you. That's the only, that is, you make the only food that beat me. You enjoy I that? I love you. Thank you. I'll Thank see you, you later. Bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye. I know what you're thinking. I left way too much food on my plate, but I think the most memorable part of this meal is gonna stay with me for a couple days, if you know what I mean. Iceland may be sparse, both in size and population, but you can see right away that this North Atlantic island nation packs a lot of punch. You know the old saying, when in Rome? Well, when in Iceland, you do as the Vikings do, which means you head towards the sea where Icelanders eat a vile and revolting dish known as hakarl. Simply put, it's rotten shark. I'm told eating it without gagging separates the men from the boys. The largest farm where Hakarl is produced is located an intentional three hours from Reykjavik. Producers aren't allowed anywhere near civilization because the smell is so foul. People are known to get violently sick just from the stench. Take a look at the Hildebrander farm. Talk about picturesque, but the beauty takes a back seat to the overriding agitation to your olfactory senses. I know in an instant where the putrefied shark is kept, an old wooden hut up the road. Hakarl is made from the Greenlandic shark, which is one of the few sharks able to live in the cold Atlantic waters here. They say the meat is poisonous when fresh because of the shark's high level of uremic acid. Those who attempt to eat the meat too soon have been known to vomit blood. Iceland's ancestors spent years trying to figure out how to treat the meat so that it can be eaten. Their solution? Let it rot. Gudjun Hildebrander runs the family Hakarl business. So the fish comes out of the water and it comes to you. Yeah. <laughs> you don't just keep it here on the... No, we don't keep it here. <laughs> uh, well, we just caught it, similar yeah. like normal fish, and we caught it in five or 10 kilos pieces uh -huh. and put it in special wooden boxes for fermentation for six to eight weeks. Wow, and then what happens? Then we hang the pieces up for, for drying. Can we see it in the boxes? Uh, no, I'm sorry, you can't. Uh, <laughs> Why yeah, not? Well, that has to be a secret. Uh, <laughs> I appreciate that. Can we see it in the drying yeah, room? We, yeah, we can take a oh, look okay. at that. Oh, OK. All right. Holy moly. This is incredible. My god. Hanging from the rafters are 60 sharks, all cut up in pieces like they were ham shanks. Each chunk that you see here is three times smaller than its original size. The meat naturally shrinks during the fermentation process, making it easier for Gujan to cut and hang each slab. They'll hang here for at least two to three months before eating. The skin looks like it would just rip you open if you touched it, it's so sharp. Yeah, it's very sharp. And in the old days, they, could, they used it like for sandpaper. They tried to use everything in the back then. I have to admit, Hakaro looks edible, but there's something about unrefrigerated meat hanging on hooks unprotected from the elements that makes me a little wary. It smells like something died. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna bring you a very good piece. I like mine medium rare and okay. not too oily. Okay, that's no problem. It's very accommodating, these Icelanders. We have a very, very good one here. Oh, yeah, I was eyeing that piece before. Wow. Beautiful piece. That is stunning. Do you, do you need me to grab a piece of fence to put it on? No, that's OK. Yeah, you're all right? Yeah, I'll just. You're just going to nail it up or something? Yeah, maybe we'll just put it up here. Oh, yeah, there you go. And uh, Ooh. see. Nice one. And smell it. Oh, my gosh. It doesn't. It smells like ammonia. Yeah. Do you want one? Sure. The smell is a little intimidating. Yeah? Yeah. Oh, boy, you are, you are one ballsy dude. OK. How is it? Tastes much better than it smells. That smell? reminds me of some of the most horrific things I've ever breathed in my life. But the taste of it is sweet, it's nutty, and it's only faintly fishy. I'll take another piece. Another one? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. no problem. It's very healthy. This is very good for your stomach. Oh. A lot of people eat it, like, for their, for their health. Psychologically, you're predisposed not to want to eat it. It just seems more dangerous now, but I, I trust you. You're the expert's expert.
Oh, that's hardcore. That's serious food. You don't want to mess with that. That's not for beginners. <laughs> oh my gosh. If rotted shark meat is an Icelandic initiation, I think I've passed the test. No matter which direction you go in, 30 minutes outside of town and you're smack dab in the middle of farm country. Minnesota's rich, affordable farmland and the promise of high wages lured early Norwegians, Swedish, and Danish to settle here. Today, they represent over a quarter of the state's population. Here on this Minneapolis street corner, we're actually standing at the crossroads of Scandinavian culture and cuisine. This is Ingebretsen's, an institution since 1921, part delicatessen, part gift shop, 100% authentic. After sampling the dried mutton and a couple of other staples like blood sausage, it's time for the quintessential Scandinavian bizarre food. So do you guys sell a lot of lutefisk here? Well, at the holidays, maybe about 500 pounds a day. Which 500 pounds it was a day? Years ago, we sold a ton a day. Now, lutefisk is the king of Scandinavian delicacies, despite its funky smell. What began as a dried piece of fish is now just a jelly-like glob of fish. And even more surprisingly, lutefisk is more popular here in Minnesota than it is back in the old country. Lutefisk dates back to the Middle Ages when it was eaten as a fasting food during Advent for the days leading up to Christmas. How and why it was developed is not really clear, but most people still traditionally eat it today around the holiday season. So you think lutefisk looks unappealing? Wait until you find out how it's made. Would you believe at one point it's actually poisonous? Minnesotans don't have far to go to get the real thing. The world's largest lutefisk processor happens to be located right here in the Twin Cities. The Olson Fish Company has been producing lutefisk since 1910. Today, they create about 500,000 pounds a year. That gets shipped around the globe, even back to Scandinavia. The process begins with dried cod that comes to Olson's directly from Norway. This cod is preferable because it's harvested in the wintertime when the fish are at their peak of quality. So once it comes in, you've got the dried product. What are the steps? They soak in water for a few days, then we add the dreaded lye. Yes, he said lye. You know, the potentially lethal stuff that's used to clean drains and ovens. Today, they use caustic soda, a powdered form of lye that's more easily absorbed by the fish. So the caustic soda actually causes the protein molecules of the fish to open up, allowing for maximum water absorption. Basically, plumping up and softening the meat. These fish are practically the chemical equivalent of ammonia. Next, the reconstituted fish are put into tank after tank after tank of fresh water for another seven to nine days. The goal is to get the pH level down to a ratio that makes them safe again to eat. This is a very recognizable thing to anybody. It looks like fish. This is pretty close to our finished product, actually. It just goes through a little bit of a whitening process with a little bit of hydrogen peroxide to get it that nice white. It's beautiful. Better living through chemistry, or yes. better eating through chemistry, as we yes. like to say. The lutefisk is then packaged and shipped. Now, this fish may look like a normal filet, but once it's cooked, the smell is just plain foul. <laughs> I can hardly wait to taste it. Lutefisk is available year-round, but the traditional time of year to eat it is October through December. And to mark this auspicious time of the year, communities all over the Upper Midwest gather together for a traditional lutefisk supper. There's one tonight in Cyrus, Minnesota, population 303, and the entire town is expected to turn out. Cyrus, Minnesota is about 160 miles northwest of the Twin Cities. It's a typical Midwestern small town situated in the midst of farmland. You can see the grain elevator, the post office, and the local church from one central perch, the Cozy Cafe, which also just happens to be Lutefisk Central for this town dinner. So the idea here is you just head to the back door and get in line. The food's gotta be good if you're here. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Wow. 300 Scandinavians and the local Lutheran pastor, the infallible representative of God in much of Minnesota, where about 30% of the population is Lutheran. Andrew Jean, nice, nice to meet nice you. Nice to meet you too. Welcome to the Cozy Cafe, beautiful Thank you. downtown Cyrus. Thank here. you, this is your place? This is my place, full oh of Norwegians and Scandinavians today. About 30 townspeople pitched in to cook this dinner, and the buffet is filled with every Scandinavian delicacy you can imagine, from krumakaka cookies and rosettes to homemade blood sausage and fish balls. 
These must be from really, really, really big fish. This is all a little overwhelming, but I can't wait to taste the lutefisk. Get a flaky one. Flaky is the best. Flaky? Flaky is the best. Is best, yeah, like that? And then don't forget the butter. Don't forget the butter. <laughs> My dinner companions today are Edna and Lila, with a combined age of 193. If anyone knows the secret to the lutefisk allure, it's these gals. See that there's plenty of butter on it, so it slides down. For something that everybody is so scared of, why do they keep eating so much of it? I don't know. It's kind of a putt. <laughs> salt? Oh, salt and pepper. Oh, you think, I, you think we need, all right. There we go. Oh, look at it in all its translucent glory. Well, now here's, here's the thing. It's definitely an acquired taste. It's very salty, it's very fishy, but it's that jelly consistency that's a little, that's a little funky. But you're right, you put enough butter on it. Mm. Once you've had a couple bites, it's really pretty yummy. Yes, I agree with you. Although I'll tell you, as the, as the meal goes on and the lutefus gets a little colder, it's a little less appetizing. The key is to avoid breathing in while eating. Once you get past the rotten smell, it tastes kind of the way you imagine it would taste, spoiled fish jello. I'm here at the Ayurvedic Natural Health Center in Salango, and the purpose of the center here is to establish perfect harmony and health in one's life through balance. That means balancing mind and body by practicing yoga, eating well-balanced meals, and undergoing special purification treatments. Ayurveda is a recognized system of healthcare in India and is used for both curative and preventative reasons. And here's something I can look forward to. At this particular center, there's also a weight loss plan that includes drinking something that comes from a cow. And I'll give you a hint, it's not milk. It's an herbal drink made with cow's urine, all carefully mixed and measured to achieve that all-important Ayurvedic balance. And this is just herbs and cow urine? Yes. And it's good for? Burning the excess of fat into your body. This medicine helps for fat metabolism. Because out of the total food composition, fat is a factor into the food which requires the highest metabolism. And this particular medicine helps to mm -hmm. mobilize the fat metabolism. Mm -hmm. Yes. All right, so I just, yeah. I just slug this down. Yeah. Yes, it's purified cow's urine, free of pharmaceuticals, hormones, and allegedly anything bad for me. By the way, just in case you have, you know, over the course of the next 30, 40 years, as you see another million patients, you should always tell them not to smell it first because it makes it a lot worse. Wow. That was good. That was not the word that I was going to think of. It's very sour and very bitter. But I, I used the right determination. Good. I can feel the fat melting away. <laughs> okay, so I've sweated in yoga, eaten a little, been spiced, greased, and baked, and topped it off with a delicious cow urine cocktail. For a great day. I think I'm through here. Brooding over the island of Maui is the Haleakala Crater, a dormant volcano covering an area the size of Manhattan. Today, I'm heading up the mountainside using a legendary road. The road to Hana is 35 miles long and it's one of the most scenic drives in the world. Hairpin turns, thundering, towering waterfalls, crashing oceanside cliffs on one side of you, rainforest, jungle, it's wicked cool. About halfway up the slope, I'll be joining a hunting expedition. Our quarry is one of the most dangerous game animals in the world. Wild boar have sharp tusks, tremendous strength, and they attack fiercely when confronted. If hunters can bring one down, they cook and eat all of it. And that's the rare taste treat that I'm hoping for. Doug? My guide is retired police officer nice Doug Chong. This is fantastic. Doug's family owns a huge tract of forest land around his home. He's been hunting here for 50 years. That's the kind of experience to look for if you're stalking wild boar. 
In this kind of hunting, the dogs do most of the real work, but the humans Gentlemen. need to be ready just in case. Our hunting party includes Doug's nephews and a few friends, including his longtime hunting buddy, Daryl. Hey, so when once we're up here, stay close to you, stay right. close to the dogs. Yeah, stay close to me. What's going to happen is the, the dogs are going out. If they pick up a scent, they're going to they're gonna pick up that scent and go with it. Wherever they end up with that pig, we got to be there. Hawaiians have hunted wild boar for about the last 200 years. <laughs> wow, are they excited. We're splitting into three teams. So if dogs from one group flush a boar, the others can move to cut it off. At first, the going is pretty easy. No wonder you do so much boar hunting. Just walking these woods with the dogs is fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> Everything's good. But things get a little tougher. Well, you know, there's no getting around it. Sometimes you just got to get wet. Finally, we're in deep, thick jungle. Not the kind of place where you want to suddenly run into an enraged wild boar. I am in the middle of a wall of wild ginger. There is a sea of it to my left. Doug is four feet ahead of me. You can barely see him. We don't know where Daryl is. <laughs> Things get pretty hinky pretty fast in a real jungle. Here I come. OK. And right about now, we get word the other team has caught up with a boar. Everybody's hurrying along because oh, one of the other teams has trapped a boar down below. The pig broke loose. <laughs> that pig and several others got away, but this one did not. It takes a village to take one of these animals down. As it's been done for centuries, the hunters string up and dress the carcass on the spot. When we get back, most of this meat will be cut up, marinated for a few days, and then smoked. But the internal organs have to be eaten fresh. It's a tradition dating back to the days before refrigeration, when returning hunters had to go ahead and cook organs and utilize the blood, ingredients that couldn't be cured and preserved. Back at Doug's place, Daryl makes na'au. The heart, liver, spleen, and intestines are chopped and cooked in a broth that includes fresh blood from the boar we've just killed. That's part of the same tradition of using every part of the animal, because frankly, blood couldn't be preserved either. OK, guys, let's eat. The smell is intoxicating. All those organs combine into one potent, heady flavor, with just a few that really stand out. This is about as gamey and funky as any food in the world. But let me tell you something, when it's done right, it's out of control. This is irony and intense. The spleen puts a little bit of sharpness and funky bile flavor in there that you're just not gonna find in any other dish. This is excellent. Wow. Doug brings out a sample prepared from another boar to show me what the meat tastes like after marinating for a few days in a sauce of sugar, soy, and Chinese spices. So this is marinated in all those goodies for a couple of days and then yeah. smoked? Three days. Smoke for about six hours. That's really nice. It's got good smoke flavor and not too overwhelming. Oh. Hunts like this one help control a boar population that might otherwise wreck the island's ecosystem. But harvesting your own food is also an important part of any cultural heritage. And I'm grateful these men shared some of their heritage with me. Guys, what a spectacular day. Thanks a lot for showing me something that I never thought I'd get to experience, a real wild boar hunt. Mm. When are we doing this again? Anytime. Tomorrow. Any, tomorrow. <laughs> For most people, Ethiopia is an undiscovered country. Foreign visitors are relatively scarce, and the only mental picture most of us have is of hungry people living in bleak surroundings. But this is no wasteland. The countryside is rugged, but beautiful. It's an ancient land whose royal family claimed to descend from King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba a proud country, one of the few in Africa that was never successfully colonized by outsiders. And it's produced the only African cuisine to become famous around the world. A communal cuisine, famous for using a bread called injera, or even just fingers, to share food from a common plate. Get out into the countryside and you realize Ethiopia has a lot of fertile land. Hunger is a chronic problem, but its root cause is the government and the private sector's inability to distribute food to everyone who needs it or to maximize the agrarian potential. 
So there are communities who've learned to get food from the most unlikely sources. Today, I'm going to see how this plant turns into a whole lot of food. Tia Village is about 50 miles outside Ethiopia's capital of Addis Ababa. Its people are Garage, one of the eight ethnic groups making up most of Ethiopia's population. I've arrived with Mulliken Tamarat, one of my guides. A foreign visitor is a rare event here in this town, and I receive some special hospitality. Are these the... So these are the heads of the family, uh -huh. and these people are their neighbors. Hello, very nice to meet you. About 200 villagers are on hand when I arrive, and I seem to get a personal welcome from every single one of them. Wow, that was a greeting. Like most places in the world, welcoming a guest means offering food and drinks. But it's the food here that interests me the most. It's prepared from the false banana tree, mm -hmm. which grows around this area. That's uh, very important for the society because it's the main food. It's a stable right. food for the whole society. They call the NSET plant false banana because it looks just like a banana tree. But NSET doesn't produce any edible fruit. So what makes it a major food source in Ethiopia? Well, as the saying goes, it takes a village. Men strip the leaves off the plant. Women strip off the broad leaves to get at the stalk in the center. The men peel away the layers of stalk, and the women shave those stalks down to a pile of fiber. This is mostly about food, but for the record, this plant provides building materials as well. So after part of the edible piece of the branch is scraped away, what's left behind is this fiber, which is extremely strong. Mm -hmm. This is very, very strong. Unbreakable. Yeah, we use it to make uh, mats and ropes and sacks. Before they're through, the villagers will cut up and use every single fragment of this plant. And okay. after they take down the leaves yeah. and after they unroot the plant, what do they do next? Then they, they smash the root and they bury it in uh, their, their hole there. So the root goes back into the hole it came from. Then it takes an enormous amount of work to get every last shred of fiber out of it, and then to mash the fibers into a paste. Now they're clapping and singing to both provide her with the energy and strength that's needed to pound this stuff for what's been over an hour now. <laughs> and you can hear the bass beat and the chanting. It's how the world's first music started, call and response. Now, when this work is done, the pulpy mass of fibers gets covered by layers of leaves and stones, and then they leave it to rot in the ground for three months. Here are the storage lockers for NSET that was stripped and pounded and buried long before I got here, very long. I'm about to see what all those weeks underground does to NSET, and not just see it. So this has been fermenting for three, for three months. months. Yeah. Smells it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like cheese. It, it is like cheese, isn't it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> What's so funny? It may seem strange, but it's a worldwide solution to preserving food without cans or freezers. It's very common mm -hmm. all over the world. Mm -hmm. Each one has its own particular nasty, horrible smell. Yeah, it's one of them. <laughs> this is one of them. But this one batch of stinky raw material will make three different kinds of food and make enough of it to give more than a dozen people three meals a day for the next 10 days. The transformation starts when the rotten and set paste is washed, then dried. When it's dry, it turns into powder and looks very much like flour. Bake it, and it's bread. Add water and stir, and it's porridge. Add the Ethiopian's favorite mix of red-hot spices, berbere, and you can eat it just as it is. And this dish is called bula fir fir. All right, bula fir fir. Mm -hmm. huh? Cheers. <laughs> if you took Limburger cheese, dried it out, turned it into a powder, and toasted it with herbs and spices, that's exactly what this would taste like. Mm -hmm. And because this is so starchy when it's ground into a flour. It's like putting a spoonful of cornstarch 
into your mouth, and it just takes away all the moisture. Mm -hmm. The seasoning is great. That Burberry and the green herbs. Mm. This is very good. Mm. Thank you very, very much. I don't know. <laughs> I love her. She's got the greatest laugh and the greatest smile. That is so, oh, oh, thank you. If you take the same powder, add water until it thickens, and add some generous globs of butter, it makes a porridge they call mook. Oh, see, it smells like that tastes. Okay, um, kind of speechless. The texture is very slippery. Mm -hmm. It's very slippery yeah. and it's very strong tasting. Mm -hmm. It takes a lot to get used to. I think I took too much on my <laughs> spoon. Wow, it's strong. Fermented in rotten foods that are made from plants that are buried in the ground, I've now decided having tasted enough of them around the world are much stronger and much harsher tasting than things like rotted meat. The plant stuff just gets a nastier flavor. You guys love this, don't you? <laughs> It's like mother's milk, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> yeah. It's like a lollipop. <laughs> wow. <sighs> oh, God. Mm. Man, please explain to them. I'm not being rude, just my, my palate isn't used to foods that like is. this. Yeah. Mm. It's the first time. Yeah. Finally, there's the bread, called kocho. Sometimes wrapped in inset leaves, sometimes not. It's very, very dense. One little slice feels like it weighs about a pound. All right, so this is cooked inside the leaf, mm -hmm. and this is cooked outside, outside the leaf. Yeah. See, much sweeter, mm. with a very faint, spoiled taste. Mm. <laughs> I like this. Mm. And this one, wow. Look at that. It's like you can make shoes out of this. <laughs> it's hardcore, it's sturdy. Oh, wow. I like this even better. Lake Biwa is Japan's largest lake, and it's home to the Funa, a rare species of carp that's used to make a prized local delicacy. The Funa are transformed into something called Funazushi and it can take three to five years to fully mature it. The town of Nagahama, on the north shore of Lake Biwa, is the only place in the world where they make it. With Toshio Hanaoka as my guide, I'm here to see a process that hasn't changed in, oh, about 400 years. And it all starts at the local hatchery. Are these fish fresh? <laughs> it's a little, little fish farming humor. Each fish is cleaned and then gutted through the gills without cutting into the fish. That's because every fish used for funazushi carries an egg sac, and you want to keep the eggs inside and intact to add to the flavor of the final product. A handful of salt, and this fish is ready for the next phase. That happens here at Kitashina. Atsushi Kitamura represents the 18th generation of funazushi makers in his family. I'm honored to be here. This is so cool. This place has been making and selling funazushi since 1619. The salted funa goes into huge wooden barrels, the same ones used for hundreds of years. Along with the fish go layer after layer of rice mixed with vinegar. Once the fish and the rice go into a barrel, they stay there for any place from one to four years. So when that lid finally comes off, well, oh, you can baby. imagine the smell. Ooh. <laughs> then again, maybe you can't imagine it. <laughs> Come on, sometimes food is so weird you just gotta laugh. Oh, yeah. yeah, I mean, that is, that has got some stink going. Ooh. Smell that. Mm. It smells rotten, but the stink is really created by microbes in that fermented rice that prevent the fish from spoiling. 99% of that smell is not dried salted fish. Mm -hmm. It's fermented rice. Right. It's the vegetable matter right. that's decomposing mm -hmm. around that fish. 
Yes. And after as much as four years in a barrel, this Funazushi's still not done. How long does it dry in the sun on the clothesline? It's about three hours. Three hours drying in the hot sun, then back into the barrel with more rice for at least another year. And then it's ready to be eaten? Yes, it's ready to eat. Wow. Wow. That, my friend, is slow food. All that time and labor make this a rare dish. The Japanese emperor came and bought funazushi from this family last year. Today, a single prepared fish costs 5,000 yen, about 50 US dollars. That's one reason fewer Japanese are eating it, as well as a stink that could peel paint off the walls. Well, okay. you ready? Yeah, okay. You sure about this? Yeah, okay. You back Turns out, Toshio, like most younger Japanese, has never even tried funazushi. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate you taking me here. No problem. Let's see. <laughs> Five-year-old fish. What do you think? It's pretty nasty. <laughs> do you like it? Um, it's not so bad. It's better than I thought. You're being nice. It's better than I thought. It's very harsh. It is. Uh, That's very. Hard. I mean, you're you're almost you're miserable right now. <laughs> I can see it on your face. Um, I'll, I'll I'll have this. Uh, no, 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 no. Sushi, that, the, that's the oh, rice. that's all right. No, no. I understand. This is probably one of the foulest tasting things I've ever eaten, and I've eaten some really foul tasting okay. stuff. Um, that doesn't mean it's not highly refined or specialized or that their art form or their tradition okay. is any less important. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is five-year-old fish that's never seen a refrigerator. I've never tasted anything like this before. Even though the taste is tough to like, I love connecting with a food tradition handed down for so many hundreds of years. So I hope the Kitamura family tradition continues for another 18 generations. In summertime, Seoul, South Korea is lush, green, and subtropical. But the winters here are long and harsh, so a lot of today's Korean cooking comes from centuries of learning how to preserve summer's food throughout the winter. The hallmark of great Korean cuisine, in fact, the way all chefs, whether they're in restaurants or in homes, are judged, is by the quality of their kimchi, pickled vegetables, or their chang, fermented soybean products. In fact, in Korea, everybody is obsessed with fermented foods. Seoul's fermented food turned out to be some of the best. Oh my gosh, that is just outrageous. And worst experiences of my eating life. Oh. But we'll get back to that. Let's start with the good stuff. Inside these 2,000 clay pots, the king of Korea's fermented foods is quietly spoiling away. They're at Seoul Farm, about 70 miles outside of Seoul. Hello. I've come here with Su Jong Kang, a chef and English teacher as my translator, to discover the source of fermented bean paste. Yes, they are all soybeans. All soybeans, wow. What happens here is incredibly simple. They grow soybeans, stone grind them, and put them into earthenware pots for years. Oh, it's much uh, firmer than I thought it would be. Can I, can I taste? So how old is this? Wow, it was made yeah. eight years ago. Eight years old? Yeah. That's old mm. food. Oh, it's so good though. Yeah, so good. There are other places making this stuff, but the basic method's the same. High tech South Korea is making one of the world's great condiments with thousand year old methods. Salty, spoiled, yes. fermented. Mm. Oh, I love this. This is really yummy. Mm. Mm. Everywhere I went in Seoul, fermented bean paste was served as a condiment, as banchan, and was used to improve every imaginable dish. Just one example. There was a noisy little place in the business district. They make a killer pork back soup, served with a side of fermented bean paste. The best part about eating in Korea are all the different flavor combinations that you could imagine. And one of the best ones that I've had in the entire time that I've been here is the braised pork meat with that fermented bean paste. The bean paste is salty and tart, has that delicate fermented quality to it, slightly turned, 
Very, very sweet, nutty, almost like sesame paste or peanut butter as well. A lot of flavor goes on in here. So fermented food can be glorious stuff. But there's another side to the story. On the same day that we visited Seoul Farm, Sujang took me to a place serving one of her sentimental comfort food favorites, fermented skate. Do they just let the fish rot? Or how do they make the fermented skate? Actually, they just cut off. Yeah. And then they put in the jar mm -hmm. and with some straw or hay mm -hmm. and the warm, in the warm place. And I think they just fermented in the sure. jar. Now, any chef will tell you, skate is the world's fastest spoiling fish. This is a species that literally pees through its skin, so the flesh is soaked with uric acid. It gets nasty even after a day or two in the refrigerator. But Koreans, like Sujang, have a taste for skate that's been spoiling for days, at room temperature. My mom used to make it. Really? Yeah. Oh, I love that. Mm -hmm. So it's, it is comfort food for you. It reminds you of your mom. Oh, yeah, sure. Oh, my gosh. Do you eat it plain? What do you do? Do you wrap it? Do you eat it with yeah. the hot pepper? What do you? Uh... Um, I just put some kimchi here. Uh huh. The idea is to bury the skate under a small mountain of banchan for each bite. In case you were wondering, the reason this won't kill you is that the good bacteria gradually kills the pathogenic bad bacteria after a couple of days. But how many of you would want to eat something that tastes like disinfectant? It's like right. someone just washed out an old rusty bin <laughs> down in the basement with a quart of Clorox or something. Oh, my God. There's only a handful of foods out there that have the reputation that this stuff has, though. Oh. Wow. The garlic, the chilies, the kimchi, the uh -huh. bean paste uh -huh. going on there, mm -hmm. four of the biggest flavors known to yeah. man, and they don't even begin to cover up yeah. the stink of that fish. <laughs> the strongest of the strongest. <laughs> oh my god, this stuff is horrific. But it's about to get worse. Actually, my dad and my brothers just tried only this one, not the, the garlics and the chilies. Yeah, only this one with Wenjang. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, they've got to be crazy. They've got to be nuts. So a bite with just one ingredient and almost no attempt to cover that stunning stink. I don't want you to go home tonight and say to yourself, that Andrew Zimmern guy, he was a big food pansy. This is how your father and mm -hmm. your brother did it? Yep. Oh, see, you can't even breathe in and get psyched <laughs> up about this food because it's just so smelly. Smell that. See what I'm talking about? That's nasty. That is nasty. Mm. <laughs> How do places that serve this stuff stay in business? <laughs> this stuff is harsh. When we started out this morning, yeah. and you told me that Koreans loved mm -hmm. their fermented foods, right. you were not kidding. That was fabulous. Thank you for a great day. Seoul is studded with little soup restaurants, often with just one specialty soup served in each place. Here's one, Nam Do, whose specialty is dead body soup. Now, supposedly, this soup earned its nickname because of its odor, also because of its taste. And the rumor has it that once you've had it three or four times, well, you actually grow to like it. I'm betting it's more than just a rumor for someone like me. Because the reason for the intense stink is that same wonderfully rotten bean paste, the national condiment. But here, it's not a side dish. It's the backbone of the main event, supported by pickled squash, kimchi, garlic, onion, green chili, red chili powder, and some stinky tofu to round out the dead body smell. <laughs> you know, nothing quite has a good stink like decaying protein matter. And here you've got the tofu and those fermented soybeans. Oh, fetid, befouled, spoiled, decadently rotten fermented soybeans. Fantastic. Mmm. See, you just take a little nibble of those beans on the end of your spoon. They're squishy and foul and fabulous. Mmm. A lot of people warn me about this soup. Do you think there's something wrong with me that I like it so much? I'm guessing yes. Mm. 
That is so yummy. Gotta go. To get a taste of the real Nicaragua, you need to get out where most of the people live, small towns and villages in the countryside. And if you know where to look, you can find some traditional eats that are unusual to many outsiders, like raw bull balls, or armadillos cooked in their own shells, or barbecued boa constrictor. To find those local treasures, I've hooked up with Josh Berman, author of The Moon Handbook to Nicaragua. Josh is coming back to visit the place where he served as a Peace Corps volunteer about 10 years ago, the roadside village of La Trinidad. It's located just north of the Sabaco Valley, one of the most fertile growing regions in Nicaragua. The Pan American Highway runs through town and right past a local truck stop serving some of the best bull testicles you'll find anywhere, Las Sopas de Juan. Big, small, little, both of the uh, bull testicles. Oh, the sizes soup, of the yeah, bowls of soup? soup. Uh -huh. You know, medium. Mediano, dos medianos. Yeah. Here, they do things the old-fashioned way. It doesn't get much more basic than this. I'm told the house specialty is sopa de huevo de toro. So, I'm going for it. Perfecto, gracias. Muchas gracias. All right. Very exciting. Why does everything sound tastier in Spanish? Bull's ball soup just doesn't sound that great to me, but when she was saying sopa de huevo de toro, it just rolls off the tongue. It's fantastic. Yeah. The soup is loaded with fresh vegetables, fresh tomatoes, and bull testicles. And there's a bonus treat raw bull testicles, marinated in lime juice. It's a bull testicle ceviche. Oh, muchas gracias. Eating bull testicles is nothing strange in a culture where money is scarce and nobody throws away any part of the animal that they can eat. This just happens to be a place where necessity makes bull balls a house specialty. But after a few years away, Josh is a little out of touch with the local fare. You don't have a really excited look on your face. We'll ease into it with some broth and some vegetables <laughs> and uh, see what happens. You can see that they still have actually some of the capullo, the sack, yeah. attached to it. You can see a little bit of the connective tissue as opposed to being fully skinned out of that. And... Mm. It's barnyardy. You know, it definitely mm -hmm. smells like the animal it came from. All right, so. Here's the raw stuff. Mm-hmm. Man. What do you think? <laughs> Pretty hardcore looking. Like any ceviche, the acids in the lime juice cure the meat during marination. No heat required. Well, these smell a little less ferocious. So. Oh, what do you think? This is very good. Yeah. It was like an eight out of 10. Yeah. That's a 12. Wow, okay. That's just out of control. Right? The lemon. It's not bad, yeah. This tastes like, you know, mud and loose change <laughs> in your pocket. You know, I mean, that's kind of what the taste of organ meat is. Uh -huh. But then you throw in those lemons and limes and onions and chilies. It's good. It's really good. They have a saying in Nicaragua, they say, Indio comido, puesta el camino. Which basically means, I've eaten and now I will go. <laughs> I like that. I was here for the food, basically. And I was it. here for the food? Yeah. And then I went elsewhere for more food. Exactly. The mountains of Sardinia are rough and rugged. This is where generations of tough islanders held out against any and all would-be invaders. Even today, it's no picnic trying to reach the people who live here. I've often said that all food tastes better the harder you have to work for it. Yep, that's all we have to do in order to meet uh, a gold herder, a real one. Here in these mountains, I hope to get a taste of Sardinian tradition I've wanted to try for years. Kasu marzu, often insultingly referred to as maggot cheese. The real stuff is made only in Sardinia, and it's now illegal to sell, even here. But the tradition is still alive and well in remote, mostly unvisited places. This is like Lord of the Rings meets 1926 yeah. Appalachia. Yeah. This is unbelievable. <laughs> Look, and the sun is coming up. Oh, Nene, 
Ciao. Ciao. E commentista, no? Non c'è male. Eh. Amico. Andrew, Andrew, nice to meet you. Giovanni Gabas has lived in these mountains all his life. Giovanni is a goat herder. This is his home year round. A single room where the only source of heat is a fire burning right in the middle of the floor. The smoke is handy for aging cheese and meat. Giovanni's been aging this wheel of Caprino made from goat's milk for about two months now. Incredible. Look at the mold and the cracking on this. <laughs> For him, the best thing to do is to eat it rather than to talk about it. <laughs> Point taken. I'm going to learn that Giovanni is utterly unimpressed by the whole TV thing, more so than anybody I've ever met. But I want to learn firsthand how he lives and how he makes his cheese. Milk goes almost directly from a goat's udder to a pot on the fire. Then rennet is added, and it's stirred as the milk separates. I'm trying to be helpful here. He said, if he doesn't understand, how can I tell him what to do? <laughs> A lifetime of solitary living means that Giovanni doesn't really explain. He just does. Do you want to know what the lesson learned here is? I'm a really crappy cheesemaker. Giovanni uses bare hands in near boiling liquid to shape the curds into what will become wheels of cheese. These will age for a couple of months here in Giovanni's smoky cottage. For lunch, we'll be eating cheese that's already aged and that's had flies lay their eggs inside it. Giovanni's neighbor Francesco drops in as we're setting the table for lunch, including a whole cured pig's leg. That's their air-dried mountain ham. Think prosciutto. Along with that twice-baked Sardinian bread. And this. This is, for me, the most interesting cheese in the whole world. Kasu Marzu starts out as just another wheel of cheese. But months later, you don't slice into it. You cut the top off and lift it off like a lid. One, two, three. Ooh, very ripe. That is some stinky cheese. And it's alive with maggots. They're larvae of a fly that lays eggs in the cheese when it's very young. Thousands of them have been eating and then excreting into this cheese. Centuries ago, probably by accident, someone tasted maggot-infested cheese and decided, wow, it's actually better after being flavored and softened by passing through the digestive system of the larvae. What's the best way to eat this? Do you scoop some of the hard stuff from the inside, the soft from the middle, both? What is the best way to eat this? Giovanni is suggesting the best way to eat it is just to place it in your mouth. OK, another point taken. Even like that, just place it in your mouth. By the way, it's a good sign that the maggots are still alive. Dead maggots would indicate that the kasu marzu would be unsafe to eat. Wow. Have you had this before? Not yet. It's so ammoniated, it actually scorches your tongue a little bit, but you want to keep eating it. This is like a piece of Limburger or blue cheese that you've left for two months in your refrigerator and forgotten about, and you smell it and throw it away. That's what this tastes like. It's very strong, very ammoniated. The texture is incredible, though. Giovanni gives his longest speech of the day to let me know Kasu Marzu is you guessed it, an aphrodisiac. He's asking if you're married. Because if you're married, then tonight is going to be your night. Grazie. I mean, it's Porto. severe. <laughs> it's too much. I like it. Now, you might think that the Kasumarzu was the most imposing edible we encountered all day. Not even close. One of the most shocking foods I've ever tasted is created inside of these, the stomachs of kid goats. And I'm about to eat a cheese created inside the stomach lining itself. This is the, the goat rennet. Mm -hmm. Rennet naturally exists in a part of the stomach lining containing enzymes that break down milk. You can make cheese by adding a little rennet to your milk, but here they add a little milk to the stomach, and it makes a kind of a cheese prized as the finest dairy delicacy in the mountains. The cheese has been aging inside this stomach for about 40 days. And of course, the best thing about it is that it's got a couple hairs in every bite. It's part of the taste. That's what really gives also the taste. Oh, my gosh. 
That's so delicious. That's insane. That's just like fat that's turned into cheese. That's what it tastes like. You know, tallow. I gotta tell you, the smell in here is almost burning your nose with ammonia. This is ammonia mixed with edible wax. Yeah. That edible is wax. gasoline and ammonia <laughs> mixed with edible wax. In this ascending scale of powerful cheeses, I think I just went over the top. 